Uh, good afternoon. I think we're going to get started for the sake of time. I'm Margaret Hedstrom. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Programs and Professor at the School of Information at the University of Michigan. I'm also the Project Director and PI of SEED, Sustainable Environment Actionable Data, a recently funded NSF data net project uh, that started on October 1st of this year. Um, also joining me from our team is Robert McDonald. He is the Associate Dean for Libraries at Indiana University and Associate Director of the Data to Insight Center. Um, and Robert is a senior staff on the project. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a little overview of our inspiration and aspirations, um, what some of our thoughts are motivating our approach to uh, the data net call for proposals. And then uh, Robert's going to talk more about how we are going about developing infrastructure to support uh, integration of data and um, long-term preservation and access. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the NSF data net program, uh, it was a very broad call that came out, well, it seems like it was a decade ago, but I guess it wasn't quite that long, um, but five or six years ago, actually, uh, looking at uh, um, new types of organizations was one of the aspects of it that would uh, integrate infrastructure development, libraries and archives, computer and information science, and domain science expertise to build uh, the capacity for reliable digital preservation and access for science and uh, engineering data over decades long time. Um, the part of the ideas were to continuously anticipate and adapt to change in both the technologies and users' needs and expectations. Um, and one had to be pretty forward thinking to anticipate that it would take three or four years to get an award approved uh, by the National Science Foundation. Um, to engage in research to drive the leading edge forward and to serve as components of what is envisioned to be an interoperable network of partners uh, providing preservation and access and other data services to scientists. Uh, I am going to really address um, the, a little bit about the new form of organization. I'll say a bit about reliable preservation and access, anticipating changes in technology, um, and maybe just a bit about being an element in uh, a larger network. I am not going to discuss the engaging in research. Um, this is in part because in the course of the uh, second round of data net proposals, they were vastly reduced. The original program were to be $20 million awards. They've been now reduced to uh, $1 million a year for the first two years. And if we develop a successful prototype, there may be $2 million a year following for the next three years. As a consequence of that, all of the research that we had intended to fund directly as part of this program uh, is either not funded or people are going out looking for alternative sources of funding for the research. Um, we, the, data, the SEED data net has a series of partners. It is sort of based at the School of Information at the University of Michigan with participating um, co-PIs and senior staff at Indiana University in the libraries and the Data to Insight Center at RPI at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, where um, one of our co-PIs, Praveen Kumar, who's a computational hydrologist and 
leading the domain engagement piece of SEED is located, as well as some participation from NCSA, and um, also at the University of Michigan ICPSR, the Large Social Science Data Archive. Um, for those of you, I, I hope that you, some of you are, have at least passing familiarity with the DataNet program. Uh, I just want to mention kind of how I see SEED fitting into, uh, with, in with other projects that are working toward building um, the DataNet uh, infrastructure. Um, I, I think our unique contributions are being, trying to address domain-driven di needs and requirements. Well, I would be a liar to say we didn't come into this with some preconceived notions about good ways to go about developing this infrastructure. We're very much um, letting the scientific, scientific community, and in our case, that is sustainability scientists, I think drive what it is we build, uh, what services we provide, how we evaluate them, and in many ways, how we engage more and more people beyond an original set of researchers that we'll be working with. Um, secondly, we are looking to serve scientists and researchers in the long tail, and I will say a bit more about that in a moment, but Cliff Lynch's remarks about not all data is big data uh, resonated very much with me because our orientation in SEED is to um, scientists who are dispersed. They have very valuable but often small data sets. They're very heterogeneous. And they have not been uh, served or addressed much by efforts to look at um, long-term preservation and access to data. Um, our, I think an, another contribution is that to the extent possible, we're trying to integrate existing tools, technologies, and services rather than building something new from scratch. And for example, um, although there's a lot of emphasis in the data net call on long-term preservation, our approach is to, to build a way of passing data that is of long-term value into institutional repositories uh, uh, and subject repositories like ICPSR rather than trying to build a whole new uh, repository infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned, we are working with sustainability scientists, um, and in particular, you know, we were re forced to put regional and, I would say, uh, subdomain constraints on our at least initial set of scientists that we're working on. So our interests are in um, ma mainly issues of sustainability of water and water resources in the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes region. Um, we chose sustainability science because it creates some very interesting problems where researchers need to integrate data uh, and looking at it on multiple scales uh, from multiple perspectives, we have multiple data types, and our goal is to provide a service that makes it possible to add value to those data sets in part by making them easily discoverable, um, uh, in some cases being able to combine them in new ways or to do computation across heterogeneous data. So the kinds of data challenges we're facing is, is the heterogeneity. So we have everything, you know, we, we will encounter everything from uh, some pretty complex GIS systems to hydrology models to streaming data to data sitting in spreadsheets uh, to kind of standard numeric files. And um, because sustainability science is looking at human uh, and 
interactions between humans and natural systems, there's a whole set of social and economic data that comes along with it. Um, we're talking about multiple scales of granularity, for example, data that's captured at a very, very particular fine point to data that is collected uh, on the basis of an entire region. Um, it is inherently multidisciplinary and, as I said, many small data sets. Uh, one of the things that we are going to focus on, in fact, are drive data sets where someone may have taken data from a very large data collection, um, selected data about a particular aspect of that, that uh, d data set, combined it with some other collections, and created drive data that has, um, it, you know, it's had a lot of time and effort invested in, in um, making it a useful resource for this community. Um, and uh, I, we, we're really driven by looking at kind of what are the economics of the long tail, the data out there in the long tail. As I mentioned, there are small and derived data sets, heterogeneous. There are many, many sources of data. So some of this data is coming from state and local governments. Some of it's coming from individuals out in the field. Some may be coming from, you know, large standardized surveys. Um, and it become, these, these data become valuable when you can discover related data of relevance and combine it to address a particular problem. Um, and so that's, that's the, uh, the area in which we are trying to make a contribution. Um, now, just in terms of our overall vision, we are kind of, we're, one of the things that we're trying to do is sort of develop a place between the researchers and their labs and where, uh, with very low barriers to entry, researchers can deposit data without strong metadata requirements. We will, um, we will secure that data for them. We will let them control the initial access to it. And using this idea of um, both social media and active social curation, as others become interested in the data and discover it, we will provide um, capabilities for things like um, commenting, recommending data, and possibly um, adding uh, metadata to it. Um, so we want to leverage social media. We're in the process of installing an instance of Vivo for our first um, set of researchers. Um, we are hoping to move data curation upstream in the data life cycle. Um, not necessarily by expecting researchers to make their data conform to long-term preservation requirements, but to get uh, a better mutual understanding of what it takes to curate data like this and um, what their specific needs are. Um, we want to involve domain scientists in setting priorities for the way SEED evolves and also I think for what kinds of data we actually invest in. Um, there's been, in, to my mind, too little discussion about uh, where, what data should we be focusing on? Uh, and there are, I think, illusions about we'll just save, we'll save everything, storage is cheap, um, you know, and I think things like the d mandated data management plans almost push people toward um, at least saving data uh, and not necessarily focus an investment in all of the things that might be necessary to make that data useful, preservable, and accessible. Um, and then taking advantage of the existing infrastructures, as I mentioned. Um, 
I think I've mentioned most of these points about active and social curation. Um, and uh, I, I, I would say we are taking a measured approach to the idea of outsourcing or crowdsourcing some of the value-added activities. We're not expecting um, armies of school children to want to mark up uh, stream flow data from the Illinois River. But we do think that within a limited community where there are uh, where there's ongoing research and there's an ongoing interest, other researchers with expertise and a need for this data may make those kinds of contributions. And importantly, the idea of people reviewing and commenting um, and rating data, I think is an important, um, has a lot of potential, I should say, to at least experiment with an equivalent to peer reviewing in the data world. Um, just quickly, our status, we started um, uh, the 1st of October, so we're in our beginning of our third month, um, and we hope to have, we plan to have, we will have a working prototype uh, 18 months into the project which hopefully will pass muster and then allow us to expand out. Um, I think, well, as I said, I was gonna say how I thought we might expand, but as I said, we're gonna let the users also help us figure out how it, it's going to evolve, so I'm not going to make any more comments on that. Um, this is just a list of you know some of our key personnel and, um, my time is up, and so I am going to just acknowledge NSF for this and turn it over to Robert to talk a little bit more about the specifics. Thank you, Margaret. Just a quick switch here with my PowerPoint, and I'll be back on track here. All right. So quickly through this, but this takes you to our wonderful new website uh, if you want a QR code on that. I've got one at the end. Um, but what I'm going to focus on really here is this uh, a little more detail about um, you know, the lifecycle support, actionable data services, and what, what we mean by actionable within the seed uh, kind of ecosystem and how that's integrated with a curation, curation and preservation infrastructure. And I just want to thank all of my colleagues here, especially uh, Jim Myers at Rensselaer, Beth Playley at IU, Brian Beecher at ICPSR. We spent a long time working on, on uh, this framework and, of course, retooling it every six months for a couple of years. And now, of course, we're kind of retooling it again to really mesh with, like Margaret said, the, um, the functional specifications that we have from our science partners. And, um, so just a little bit about, you know, the challenges that everybody knows that are out there right now. You know, um, managed data storage and services are, are, are not cheap. They're, they're quite expensive when they're managed. Now, if you can go get, a, of course, a terabyte of disk space and put something on it and not manage it, that's very cheap. It's very affordable. But really, the FTE and managing that piece and managing it within the enterprise uh, at scale is, is, is the component that we're going to be dealing with here. And uh, as our partners at ICPSR know, begging for metadata doesn't work. Actually paying for it did work in a big project for them. Uh, but of course, we're not paying for metadata here. So we're gonna have to use, um, uh, much like Cliff was talking about earlier, uh, the best in our machine uh, intelligence agents and processes to tr try to sift through that metadata and, and enrich it over time uh, and capture as much as possible directly from the, the data source of the experiment. Um, the other big piece, um, uh, that, that Margaret talked about is, is the long tail is not standardized. We're, we're kind of uh, um, uh, working on the fly here in terms of uh, working in an agile process toward what we build to glue together the types of community source software that we want to use to, to put our, our final framework together. Uh, we know that the data models that, that we're working from this uh, will, will evolve over time. 
And we also know that, you know, every six months that cyber infrastructure picture changes. <laughs> and, you know, at the bottom here we had this uh, piece originally in some of our slides where we said, you know, if you build it, they may not come. Well, we, we, all, we all know if you build some giant thing and you don't build the community first or build it and, and leverage all of it as you go, you're not going to have enough users because it's not going to meet the needs of those users. So that's a key component of what we're, where we're really working here with SEED. Uh, on trying to do that with our scientific communities with the Illinois uh, River Basin um, uh, scientists. Um, now, a little more detail about what we're talking about here, and, and, and I found it interesting because, you know, when I put these slides together, I thought, well, this is not going to be new, new for anybody, or, you know, people aren't going to be that interested in what I'm talking about here today. But then I heard Cliff's talk, and so it was such a refreshing kind of opening for a lot of what I'm talking about because our social networking component, and, and what, what I mean by social networking component, that's easy to look at it and say, oh, you're talking about Facebook. No, I'm really talking about uh, science of science and, and how you can do analytics across the right type of data there with, with uh, science of science approaches. And looking at co-authorship and co-funding and how you actually put that together in a way that could be linked data across repositories. That's one of the, the interesting things we want to try here with our uh, repository partnerships. And so at this point in, in my talk, I wanted to ask, who here has an institutional repository at their, at their home institution? Raise your hand. Well, that's great. How easy is it to, for, you to, for you to take some of your data in that repository and move it to another repository? It's still hard for me, but I got my hand raised. I know how I could do it, right? That's going to be the next step in terms of how we interoperate together as repositories. And as you saw there, there was a, almost everybody here had some kind of institutional repository. Another question, how many of you are publishing data in that institutional repository now? All right, we got a few, few folks. That's great because that's, that's the key piece we're going to be focused on here. Now, I think there's other elements of linked data and sharing that can happen there, but the piece that we're most interested in right now are in terms of getting that data published and getting it put out there within our federated repository uh, working group so we have a permanent place for that data to live and in particular so that we share the infrastructure from our institutions. And I'm going to get into a little more of that uh, later on. But the, the big piece that we're seeing there now, and, and it was interesting, um, I, I've heard the, the microcitation concept explained a few different times now by people who work in the areas of um, chemical information and uh, big pharma. And I also heard, uh, I was a, uh, a talk the other day where I heard somebody kind of compare it to this. What if you could get, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if your scholarly communication model evolved in such a way so that every uh, piece of uh, software update that you did to GitHub was a micro citation and gave you credit for that in terms of a publication. That's exactly what we're talking about here in, in, in how we're publishing our data within Seed and how we want to move that forward for the long term and tying it to the social networking components that we're going to use. And in particular, um, with that, we're going to use um, uh, an open source product, uh, Vivo. And uh, there are other pieces out there that are, that are open source. There are other pieces out there that are vendor-based, uh, like Colexus, which is now part of Cybal. And in, in particular, I thought that was of interest from, from Cliff's opening statement in terms of the metrics piece, because uh, I did a five-minute lightning talk on metrics not too long ago, and, and I've had more requests for a follow-up on that just because it seems like that's, that's at the point of interest now for, for uh, research institutions. But if you take a look at this, this would be like an open data model from a, a chemical information component. And then this is an actual live one that we have up in our Vivo instance at IU that's ma mapping Cotty Borner's publications to a scientific map of disciplines. And one of the things we want to do with our uh, science of science component of um, seed is to actually be able to do that with the, the content of our data sets across disciplines with that kind of a automated mapping. And this is nothing that, that um, uh, took work. It was, it was all built into the Vivo processes that are there in Vivo. So some of the key seed questions that, you know, we really have to ask ourselves moving forward in this, especially in this 18-month prototype, is what could seed capture and when, and how much could it capture at the point of origin for, for some of these scientific uh, experiments? And how can C provide direct value to our data producers, users, and curators? That's going to be the make or break for us, whether we can get that functional specification directly from our users built into, you know, what we're putting together as kind of a, you know, what I call enhanced glue for the types of open source tools we're putting together for people to, to be able to use this way. And, you know, how can we use robust web services and social computing to lower barriers and reduce and realign costs for kind of that mass crowdsource curation? Uh, just um, a little bit more about uh, the, the repository. The, the three pieces that, I, that I, I'm iterating a little bit here today are the active curation component, 
the, uh, the social uh, networking component and the kind of what we've been calling the virtual repository, which is like a thin layer repository that enables, uh, uh, you know, uh, temporary storage of, uh, of data in terms of moving it into our federated repository infrastructure. And that's exactly what we're after here is to leverage existing resources. And a, and a couple years ago, I used to give a talk and I would ask people how many people counted their data in terabytes. And I'm sure most of us could raise our hand to that now. And now, now everything that I'm talking about now really needs to be thought of in petabytes. And if we're not looking at leveraging existing infrastructure, and one of the key tenets of what we put together for SEED always had been in taking a huge chunk of infrastructure both from IU, from NCSA, from UIUC, uh, now with uh, Rensselaer on board with their uh, computational um, uh, nanotechnology and innovation center, and seeing how that could provide, a, um, you know, a, a, if you will, a cyber infrastructure layer to provide for the data throughput into the repositories for the long-term preservation of the content. And you'll see that the repositories we're working with are the Michigan Deep Blue, IU ScholarWorks, ICPSR's repository, and UIUC's Ideals repository. Just a little bit more, of course, we have to have a few technical um, uh, pictures here. Uh, this is the, 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 you know, kind of the layer cake view. If you cut it straight through the middle, you'd see there are a network of data producers who are putting uh, their content in through our active uh, content repository and taking advantage of our social and uh, scientific networking components. And then that's moving into our virtualized archives that eventually ends up with the data in its home areas. Uh, for the, the institutional repository and storage, managed storage infrastructure that we're taking advantage of for that. A little bit more about that, we, we think of it as, as having this active workspace that really is able to collect data uh, at the source of the experiment and work with it uh, in, in the most granular format and then bring that back into our repository areas. And like I said, toward Petascale, we'll see an Internet 2 upgrade pretty soon. Uh, we'll see the bandwidth of that uh, jump from 100 gigabits per second to 8.8 .8 terabits per second. There's a terabit component again. And once we see that, we're going to have to think really hard about how our next generation data systems sit on that network. They cannot sit in the middle of our institutions between many, many firewalls and expect to have data moved around well. They can't sit there if you're going to use some kind of a wide area file system that makes the data through the throughput of the network appear as if it's close to computational resources like we're going to see uh, set up under the, the NSF XSEED program. And moving a petabyte of data will hopefully go from around a 10-day prospect to a 25-hour type of prospect. And while our data in SEED doesn't exactly fit with this, our data actually causes other types of problems because it's lots of small files. It causes other types of problems for hierarchical types of storage systems in terms of compute power. We'll also see um, uh, the, the fact that we want to federate our repositories. And so, yeah, lots of repositories will have lots of small files, and that will end up being at a petascale once we start being able to share that a little bit better. So within our 18-month prototype, we're going to target uh, these key components of the active and social content curation. We'll have a pilot active content repository uh, using Vivo. We'll have an exemplar service for data ingest, discovery, reuse, and curation. And then within that, we'll also have our virtual archive for long-term access. Uh, We'll be uh, uh, having our data model in place, our protocol design development, and our pilot federated repository infrastructure in some sort of test in that 18-month period. And just a little bit to leave you with, I, I'm not going to read all of these because some of these Margaret covered and some of these I've already covered in some of my slides, but to really reemphasize the, the key components, to have the community input on the agile development for what we build as services. Uh, to have an active curation layer that actually pulls in data uh, as close to the experiment as possible and is able to derive from that um, uh, information about uh, who created it and what they're publishing and how that ties in with the rest of the scholarly communication stack. And then we'll leverage existing institutional resources for long-term access rather than trying to build resources ourselves. We're, we're going to actually tie in the, the, the institutions that I talked about, existing resources in new ways. And I think we'll see, especially with this I2 upgrade, different types of data systems emerging at some of these uh, cyber infrastructure um, uh, kind of powerhouse places because they're going to build new types of systems that will be about data brokering, whether it's actually in moving data from one cloud to another or whether it's actually uh, uh, getting the data close enough to a computational system. Um, the other big piece here is the sustainability and resource growth partnership and collaboration that we want to engender here for what we're doing. 
And a lot of that drives from the fact that uh, uh, our core cyber infrastructure team has worked uh, greatly with software development and in looking at um, uh, long-term sustainability models for that and how to build communities for that types of software. And the things that we're actually using here are, are actually already have communities around them that use uh, the software in other ways than what we're doing here with Seed. But for the long term, we hope to uh, give back to those uh, communities with what we um, actually build here from our scientific uh, community input. And with that, I think we are ready for questions, and I hope we'll have really good questions and good input. We had a recent panel of data nets, and I walked the floor kind of like Phil Donahue, so I hope you're not going to make me do that in this big hall today. Uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, you might, if you could go to a mic, it'd be great because you're recording it. Um, thanks. So you mentioned, I think Margaret mentioned that um, there's still an intention for the DataNet projects to form some kind of network, hence the name DataNet. But uh, could you say anything at all about how you think you'll be collaborating with the current and other recently funded projects? Is there anything happening with that um, or any discussion with NSF about how that might work? Um, is this on? Yes. yes. Uh, I think there are two mechanisms that that are in place, maybe not operational yet. Uh, in late January, there is going to be a meeting of the PIs of the data nets and the uh, interop projects in Indiana, um, and that's going to be the first time that we've been formally brought together. It's a challenge. The call itself said, how are you going to interoperate with these other data nets, but you can't know what they are because no one knows what they are yet. Now that we know, um, you know, the finite number, what the goals are, I think um, we have, you know, some concrete basis for moving forward. The other possibility is um, smaller proposals for research coordination network awards, which I am just beginning to understand, but uh, certainly with the expectations of collaboration uh, and working on interoperability on very much trimmed back travel budgets, um, you know, we're going to have to, I think, get some additional resources to have some workshops. I should also add that, um, you know, we want to, we, I, I think it would be unfortunate if the focus was only on the data nets and the interop projects. I think you know, there's going to be interoperability on numerous levels, and I think the piece that we're hoping to contribute to is interoperability between our service and institutional repositories. But I could see interoperability in lots of other dimensions as well. Um, so, you know, well, those are the two, you know, initial I guess, concrete things that I see, and maybe Robert has some more ideas. Well, I also see another interoperability layer there from the next generation type of data utilities we're going to see that, that will be for, for larger, you know, much larger data, big data, and will help it either move around or get closer to HPC resources, but then that derived type of data, uh, finding a way for that to, to find long-term homes in our repositories is the only way to really leverage the, the resources that we have out there. Um, in a, in a lot of ways for that. I think I should, just one other comment on this, um, and it's not, it's take, uh, it's moving to a slightly different subject, but um, I think what's interesting, uh, and Cliff mentioned in his opening remarks about how it isn't really, nothing is really shaken down as to whether, and this was with regard to the data management plan requirements, whether universities would be providing these services to their researchers, whether domains would be provi providing these, you know, you'd have sort of topical uh, repositories, uh, whether they might be federally funded services of some sort. 
or commercial. Um, we're, we're looking at this in the sense that both, you know, Vivo has been deployed on an institutional level. We're trying to deploy it for a domain. And that's sort of an interesting experiment in whether you can sort of move out of the box of the institution and focus on a science-driven domain to uh, use this to tie a community together. Likewise, the institutional repositories are institutionally based, but we're going to try to mix things up quite a bit, not just among the institutional repositories that are, and ICPSR, which is not an institutional repository, it's a topical repository, um, you know, whether we can mix things up among those as well as potentially other institutional repositories. Is that Jeremy? Yeah. I, Jeremy. Uh, I see Jeremy in the back there. I was wondering what, uh, what you were saying about the interoperability with the repositories. What, um, with a very different kind of data, what issues you might be encountering or expect or what measures taken to prepare those repositories to handle that kind of data and ensure it can be preserved? Um, so one of the very first things we're doing and we'll be starting on it next uh, month is working with a particular uh, group of sustainability scientists at the National Center for Earth Systems Dynamics in, at the University of Minnesota. They are an NSF STC that is sunsetting. So they have data and the infrastructure that's been government funded to you know, collect and work with this data is going to go away. Part of what we're trying to do is extract um, a lot of information about their data types, their data models, uh, the data standards that they use to get an understanding of that variety and heterogeneity. I look at the active content repository is kind of a soft landing zone for data that scientists may still be using a little bit, but they're kind of looking to give it up and hand it off to someone else to take care of. And it's sort of, I think, in that, um, in that, that uh, active curation portion of the project where the real specifics of the integration and interoperability issues on a data level are going to be exposed. And then on the repository end, although we're much less specific about it because you know, we have this looming 18-month deadline, interoperability between uh, publications and the data that they reside on or that they represent uh, is going to be another interoperability problem. So, I mean, I look at interoperability pretty broadly. Hi, thanks for the presentation. It was great to hear about your project. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your plans for the prototype for public uh, access and discovery of what's in the repositories. Well, there, there will actually, there'll be a component of that, but um, that'll probably be a, a lighter weight piece of it right now um, than some of the other parts that I mentioned uh, around the, you know, the, uh, the actual uh, ingest of data and the, the active curation uh, component and the social networking component. I think more of our discovery layer will eventually be derived from that social networking component, uh, but a lot of it will, uh, you know, of course, uh, take a little bit of work in, in, in gathering that data first and then being able to do something with it in some kind of faceted approach that could then let you dig into it based on, you know, who published the data and, and how that works. But, you know, I, uh, that eventually will be there, but it, it, that 
the, the, the core elements that we're working on that 18 month timeline will probably be less focused on that and more on uh, how we get the, uh, the data we need for the network components uh, for the actual researchers and how we tie that to the uh, uh, repository components. I think for the, um, the prototype that access to the active content repository is going to be pretty restricted to um, a specific designated community because this is data that you know may not be ready for prime time yet, uh, may have all kinds of other restrictions on it. Uh, when it passes the barrier from the active content repository into institutional repositories, certainly you know the public access dimension will you know very much come into play and. We have questions about, um, you know, what do the policies need to be around the active content repository that, you know, if you make it too open, it's a real disincentive for people to put their data out there because it's not really clean or they might get scooped or there are proprietary or, um, you know, confidentiality concerns. So, you know, as I, as I said, it's a kind of, intermediary place for, to hold the data, to do some value added activities, and to get a sense from the community itself who thinks this, val this data is valuable and worth taking to the next step. Uh, different question then. The Coming back to this relationship between um, disciplinary services and institutional infrastructure, in, in earlier um, runs at the DataNet program, sustainability was a big part of the projects. And, and I wondered if your project has any components of that still, and if not, how you're thinking about that, since this has been a big problem for us for a long time, trying to serve disciplinary needs with inf institutional funding. Um. So the, I guess one aspect of this being the long tail is that the, this data dispersed among multiple institutional repositories and requiring relatively little curation after it leaves the active curation process. Um, from a cost perspective, you know, an, an assumption I have is that it hides in there with lots of other little data sets. I don't mean it in quite such a, uh, you know, um, uh, covered manner, but, um, our, you know, part of our assumption was that if institutional repositories are going to be part of the infrastructure, then we have to count on being able to rely on something. Now, we're also talking about redundancy so that we're not dependent on a single institutional repository. Um, but at this point, uh, having had, we had actually a whole, we had an entire faculty person devoted to looking at sustainability models. The funding for that is gone. Uh, you know, I would say at, until we get through the prototype, we don't have uh, focused resources to, you know, validate or challenge any of the assumptions we have about institutional repositories willingly and readily taking this on. Now, I will say that um, what I hear from the other direction is that many institutional repositories are interested in getting into the data business, but having some difficulty figuring out which data, which types of data, how to get the data, um, and I, I guess I see us sort of greasing the wheels in that regard. So I, I think I mis-asked um, mis that question because I'm not 
I'm not doubting that institutional repositories will continue to play a role in this. It's your active repository, the front end. Oh, the front that end. That is a centralized service that mm -hmm. your project is building and running. It, it isn't a distributed federated thing and it's aimed at a discipline. So I don't quite see yet how that fits into this ecosystem that we're talking about and whether you're planning to work on the sustainability of that piece of it, you see, yeah. I, and I think some of that comes into play with, with the committed resources that, that we do have from, from IU and how we could put those toward what we've done in recent years, MOUs with other places like the Texas Advanced Computing Center and with Rensselaer on how we swap out data resources that are committed for the long term for this type of activity. Now that being said, you know, how big does that have to get before the, the institution goes, oh, we, we can't do any more of that, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. I guess I would say one other piece of that, this is that for the curation work, adding metadata, finding errors, um, improving documentation, we are looking at a model of, you know, micro contributions by scientists themselves as they use this data. Whether that is uh, just a pipe dream or something that we can actually enable remains to be seen. But I think, you know, you've, you're, you're pointing to a very important potential weakness in this, in the fact that we have a grant to fund something that's supposed to be sustainable. Kevin. My question, in a sense, follows on on that, but it also touches on something I think Robert brought out in his, his introduction about the, the issues of moving content uh, between repositories. In a sense, when, when sustainability goes wrong, as we've seen with a number of domain systems, you're forced to the problem of moving content around between different technical infrastructures and different organizational infrastructures. Uh, now, I, I'm aware that in your project you are looking at moving between these, moving content between the active curation domains and, and the institutional domains. It, what wasn't clear to me is whether you're also going to test out moving content between um, domains that are similar in function but maybe different uh, technologically or organizationally. Let's say moving between institutions. So I know there's been a very small amount of work done on this, but I think not nearly enough and we could do with a lot more knowledge. Yeah, I, I, I think that's something that we would like to have as, as a real opportunity, especially with, you know, like I mentioned, the upcoming Internet 2 upgrade, because, you know, everyone always says, well, this is an answered question. Well, not if you really want the data moved in any, you know, normal amount of time, right? Or you didn't write it to disk and actually ship it through FedEx uh, to do it reliably and all the time. And that's what I was talking, uh, you know, a little bit about before. And one of the interesting parts about when we started this, this data net, was getting the CIOs on board a bit from the institutions because they understand that this coming, uh, you know, kind of piece for them is going to be more about where these resources are located in terms of the network uh, more than anything else because of the, you know, what you're talking about. And, and in fact, you know, I use committed a certain amount of data for this activity to grow over a certain period of time for it. And I, I see us using that, you know, uh, with what we have now, with our data capacitor, and even uh, moving toward our next generation system, which is yet to be kind of uh, put out there yet. But, you know, its whole uh, modus operandi will be about uh, brokering data movement across networks at, at, at real scale. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for finding out more about what really needs to be there um, and, and making sure that we're able to do some of that with this project. I, those are interesting points, I mean, the, the, the technical ones about the network, but I'm also thinking about you know, institutions do disappear, they merge, they split, uh, and, and responsibility for domain repositories comes and goes uh, as well. And we're then faced with challenges that are partly technical, but, but partly very, very different in trying to move content between entirely different management domains with different concerns. And often people haven't planned for that from the outset. They've thought about you know, the changes that happen within your institution, but not the changes that happen when somebody else needs to take it on. Yeah. Um, ICPSR celebrated its 50th anniversary in October, and the University of Michigan will celebrate its 200th anniversary in 2014. So, I don't know. I, I, the, as, as 
institutions go, I think universities and university libraries are pretty stable things, uh, certainly relative to, say, cloud services, or let's start a data center, you know, and then worry later about, you know, what to do with the data when the project ends. I, the risk of, I don't wish to dominate the conversation, I don't disagree that on average, universities are long-lived institutions. Uh, and and IC, ICPSR is also a great example of a, of a long-lived data repository. But we've also got, it, it only takes a few to change, and we've got, and certainly in the UK alone, I can give you enough examples of institutions disappearing, going bankrupt, funders changing their minds about the domain repositories they want to support, that it's a real problem that, well, we've seen failures in the past, um, and, and it would be good to know how to avoid the, those failures in the future. Sometimes we will have to move stuff, and, mm -hmm. I, and I'd like to be more confident that we can do it without pain. And I'm, I'm interested to know whether your project's gonna help us answer that. Uh, I was wondering if you are addressing on any of the usability issues behind uh, data preservation. You know, one of the inherent challenges with data is that uh, it's much more than bits and bytes, that they come with uh, readme files and contextual information. Interpretation is very domain, science-specific and complex. So you could imagine that a data set would be readable 50 years from now, but it would not make any sense to those who would want to use it in scientific sense. Right. Um, specifically, where I think we might make a little headway in that regard is what makes a domain like sustainability science interesting from, to, to address that challenge is that you have a hydrologist and you have a soil scientist and you have an urban planner. And they're all looking at what will happen if we increase the amount of impervious surface in this river basin by 25%. And they all need data that you can somehow integrate and get a reasonable answer or set of parameters to that kind of problem. So I don't think we can start solving these problems by saying this very specialized, we're gonna make this very specialized data now um, understandable to anybody else. But in a sort of pairwise, step-by-step -step way, if we can get a soil scientist to understand the hydrologist data, then maybe the next step is that we can get an economist to understand the model that the urban planner and the hydrologist and the, you know, soil scientist put together. Um, that, whether that is something scalable, I don't know, but I think it begins to look at one piece of what could otherwise be an intractable problem. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, well thank you very much for your participation. It's very thank helpful. You.